So far, the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that's striking is how really hard to do it would be. Um, of course, we've learned that it's something we should try to do to, to be those that learn from Jesus and make ourselves followers of Jesus and doing what Jesus said. But man, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, you realize how impossible it is which is the point, uh, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, one of the main points is you walk away going, wow, who then can be saved? And maybe even a better question, how can a person be saved? If the Sermon on the Mount is true, which it is, how can you be saved? Well, the answer was not given in the sermon, the answer was delivered by the answer. <laughs> the, 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 the Jesus is the answer to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is the embodiment of the answer when he would go to the cross and die for a fallen, sinful world. Um, so like, you know, when we go back to chapter five and we, we ended last week with these humbling words, uh, verse 48, uh, where it says, you know, be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. That's, that's a pretty tall order. Uh, and you realize, wow, we're, we're not gonna achieve that perfection uh, exactly. But, um, you know, it sets the standards pretty high. And, and we kind of left off, by the way, talking about biblical perfection and how there's three main layers. And I just want to remind you, you know, we talked about positional perfection. That is, when Jesus died on the cross and his blood covers our sins, then we are declared righteous. Uh, you might say positionally perfect. In Christ, you and I are declared perfect before God uh, because he was the spotless lamb. We get to be declared perfect. So that's pos positionally, we're perfect in Christ. So that's how Jesus is the ultimate answer for the Sermon on the Mount right there. But there's also, we talked about progressive perfection where you and I are moving on to perfection and it's a work in progress, uh, you know, but we have a long way to go. Some of us longer than others. <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of work to do still, but we're, we're working toward that progressive moving on to perfection. And I showed you scriptures that talk about that kind of perfection in the Bible. And then promised or ultimate perfection. The future, when we see him, we will be like him. Uh, when we go to heaven, all our tears will be wiped away. The old things will be passed away. It's gonna be glorious, the promised uh, perf perfection. Um, chapter five, um, if we could break this down into sort of themes so far in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter five is the righteousness we are to possess. That's what chapter five is all about, the righteousness that we are to possess. Um, um, you know, like the beatitudes of the first part, not the do attitudes, the be attitudes, what we're supposed to be. And that's what Jesus talks about in chapter five. Chapter six, however, is the righteousness we are to practice. That's what we're gonna look at here in chapter six, the righteousness we are to practice, practical things we can do. And it also will deal with our relationship with God. Um, which is so important, chapter six. Chapter seven, which we probably won't get to tonight, um, is our relationship with others. And he'll focus his sermon on that. So uh, we're gonna take tonight righteousness we are to practice, practical things we can do, Sermon on the Mount. Um, one thing that you gotta also remember, Jesus was talking to believers. Uh, a lot of the people that were there were believers in Jesus, just soaking up his words. But another audience that we need to be very aware of was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, they were all there listening as well. And that's why Jesus would directly talk to them and call them out in several places. We'll see that uh, even as we get going. But, um, but the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, let's talk about them just a little bit because we need to know the audience that Jesus is talking to. Who were the Pharisees? Um, they were separatists. They were separatists, religionists. They were the cream of the crop, self-righteous, uh, you know, holier than thou uh, people uh, that were around. In fact, interesting, um, when you go into the original language of the Bible, talking about Pharisees, this interesting word here is, um, you know, uh, Pharisaeos, which is where the word Pharisee comes from, from the Hebrew word, uh, which is the same meaning, uh, parash is where the Pharisee comes from, and from the, Greek, from the Hebrew to the Greek. But you'll notice both definitions are similar. A separatist, exclusively religious, to make distinct, to declare, to distinguish, to separate. And the Pharisees separated themselves out. They didn't even wanna touch an unclean person or a sinful person. Uh, they wouldn't even look in that direction of that person. So um, the, the Pharisees, who were they? Well, they, they were uh, sort of uh, the, the, the successors of the uh, Hasidians or later uh, um, um, uh, coming from the, the Essenes and what have you. We'll talk about those later. But um, the Pharisees started popping up. You'll notice that there's no Pharisees in the Old Testament. Uh, 
Uh, so that was kind of a new thing that came up in the intertestamental period. And by the way, the Pharisees popped out into history back when, um, when uh, remember the Maccabean revolt and the whole Antiochus Epiphanes Hanukkah story? Right after that happened, that's when we started seeing Pharisees come onto the scene. And so um, the, the first mention of Pharisees actually is not the Bible, it was Josephus, the ancient historian. And he, he writes about the three different sects of religionists, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. Um, and the, the Pharisees were the group that was into the precise, every minute detail of the law, that was sort of their thing. They were, they were, remember they were counting out their spices, you know, nine for me, one pepper for the Lord. Nine peppers for me, one pepper for the Lord. Cumin, spice, all that stuff. Um, Paul was a Pharisee, Acts 23 tells us. Paul was a Pharisee in verses six through eight. Um, but they had religious form, but nothing else. They had the form of religiosity, but they weren't really good dudes, actually. They were actually kind of evil uh, dudes for the most part. Um, now I have buddies in Jerusalem, uh, Steve Ben Yeshai, you guys know our tour guide over there, great dude. And he, he kind of says that the Pharisees get sort of a bad rap. Um, and you say, well, how can you say that with Jesus sort of yelling at them all the time? Um, and I get that, but, but there, I, he, he would argue in some ways that the Pharisees uh, were not all bad, uh, but there were evil parts of them. Of course, Jesus was calling them out, but um, I've, I've kind of been interested in studying the Pharisees and sort of what were they doing? Uh, but I find it hard to find anything good, really. Um, and no wonder Jesus, he calls them a generation of vipers. Uh, what do you think of when you think of a viper? Some of you are thinking about a car right now. Um, <laughs> But most of you that are Bible people are thinking, yeah, Satan, you kind of think of Satan. So when they, he says, you're a generation of vipers, man, that's, like, that's, like, that's bad news right there. Um, and frequently rebuked by the Lord. Uh, we're gonna see that coming up in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is gonna kind of let them have it. Um, and they showed themselves to be bitter and persistent enemies of Jesus. So that's my biggest hang up with the Pharisees is they hated him and they didn't like what he had to say. Um, then you have the Sadducees, um, which are kind of an interesting group. They're, they're more of the liberal theology guys. Um, the Pharisees were theologically conservative. The Sadducees were theologically more liberal. liberal. Um, um, they were sort of an outcome of the, Greece, the Grecian um, influence. Uh, there's actually a thing you can study called Hellenism, which is the Greek influence on the known world at that time. <clears throat> the Sadducees were kind of like Pharisees that had been affected by Hellenism. And you might picture sort of the uh, college theologians with the pipe puffing, cardigan wearing uh, sweaters. That's kind of the Sadducees. And they would like be pro LGBTQIA, B, C, D, E, F, G. And they would, um, they would sort of be all, you know, loosey goosey with their theology. That's sort of the Sadducees. But they also didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in life after death or the resurrection. But Jesus, uh, would not like the Sadducees either. John the Baptist called them a, a generation of vipers. Uh, they were called hypocrites, wicked, adulterous generation. Um, they, d they denied the existence of angels. Um, they, they basically unsupernaturaled everything religious and made it just kind of material and stuff. Uh, they were often super rich. They were very wealthy. They were kind of like your, um, you know, money grabbing, uh, you know, religion people, uh, you know, that are, that are into uh, having uh, tons of luxury around them. That was the Sadducees. But they also hated Jesus. Uh, that's where the Pharisees and Sadducees put their heads together is when they hated Jesus. Um, so uh, they, they, they sort of openly sinned. Uh, that was the Sadducees. Um, now, why did Jesus spend so much time talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees? Well, the people of Jesus's time, they sort of said, well, those are the guys. If you're gonna be a religion person, if you're gonna love God, that's the example. That's sort, of the, the, that's sort of the model that we're supposed to go for when it comes to this idea of... Um, you know, religion. And so Jesus is correcting something that's really out of whack. And I have to say, this is why I think this is so important for you and for me to study the Sermon on the Mount, because we're living in the same day. We have our Pharisees and we have our Sadducees. We have our theologically liberal people, free in Christ, man. Uh, we, can, we can drink as much alcohol as everybody else. We can have sex and we can do this stuff and homosexuality is gay pride month at their churches and the triangle and the flag, they fly. Well, we've got the same groups today. And then we have the religious legalists that are hardcore, uh, sometimes even cult type level, um, <clears throat> you know, religion that's kind of grotesque. 
And, you know, and that comes out in different ways uh, depending on which group you're a part of. Um, let, let me just think of an example. Uh, one example is, you know, you guys you, that go to AC Creek, you know, you've taken the mark of the beast. Why have we done that? Does anybody want to guess why would somebody say you've taken the mark of the beast? Somebody said it. Because you meet on Sunday morning. There's a whole group out there, religious legalists, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, the hardcore ones. There's different sects of the Seventh-day Adventists, but that's why they call them the Seventh-day Adventists. It's all about the Sabbath, which is Saturday. Now at Eighth Group, we cover all our bases, two services on Saturday, <laughs> three services on Sunday. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> but um, that's what I would call religious legalism and it's wacko. Um, and I can tell you it's wacko because of what the Bible says. By the way, um, one of the modern day versions of these Pharisees and, and Sadducees, you might say are the Hasidic Jews in Jerusalem. They, they, they're, the, they're sort of the modern day version of this sort of same group of religionists. But when it comes to like things like the Sabbath day, should we meet on a Saturday or Sunday? Just remember what Paul told the Colossians, let no man therefore judge you in meat, amen to that, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Um, you know, people, they made too much of the Sabbath day. When did the church start meeting on Sunday? Interestingly, after Jesus rose from the grave. He rose from the grave on a Sunday. So the synagogues were always busy on Saturday because that was the Sabbath day. The Sabbath of the Jews uh, sort of monopolized the synagogues, but on Sunday morning, ghost town at the synagogues. So the, the church that were coming um, to what I would call the fulfillment of Judaism, when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, those Jews that said, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah we were looking for, they were continuing Judaism only in a Christian way because Jesus would become the centerpiece of it, which he should have been. And that's why, because he rose on a Sunday, the church started meeting on a, on a Sunday. But what's your point, Brett? So Sunday's the right day? No, I'm just saying don't, don't make a big deal out of what day it is. Um, and so all that to say, Jesus is dealing with all kinds of legalism, but also liberalism, kind of like in our day. So that's where we are. Well, let's get to it before we lose the whole night here. Um, so uh, the first section of chapter six, I'm gonna call this guidance on giving. Guidance on giving. Uh, and uh, this is an important one, verse one. It says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which is, seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Okay, so interesting, we've got this word alms, and it's a fun word. Now, what do you guys think of when you think of the word alms? Yeah, yeah, like um, for the most part, you're giving something, maybe money or whatever, but um, a little bit of a deeper dive into this word um, is kind of a great, uh, the, the word alms, you might just wanna keep it to alms because the Greek word is hard to say. El e musoene uh, is the word. El, el e musoene is the, the word. Um, it, which means, interesting, mercy, pity, righteous deeds, um, the benefaction itself, the act of, you know, something that you're actually doing to help somebody and a donation to the poor. So that, that donation to the poor is what we typically think. Somebody's giving alms and you picture the old beggar in the Bible, alms for the poor, alms, as he's sitting on the side of the road. And that's probably true, uh, what they would do. But the word alms is more all encompassing. And by the way, uh, it's interesting, the root word uh, from that big long word, um, the Greek word is elios, which means mercy. Um, and it's the word we always use for mercy. So it's kind of cool because, it, it, remember how we were getting into the nouns and verbs? Uh, was that last week? I forget when we were doing that. But um, the same things here. Uh, like the noun verb issue, alms is the action of showing mercy, is really the idea. Um, uh, so alms is the verb form. Uh, elios is the more noun. It's the what. It's the person, place, or thing that you're giving uh, to help someone. 
is the elias, but alms is actually the doing of it or the giving of it, uh, the action. So this is what Jesus uh, was talking about. Now he says, when you do this, which the idea is, again, you should do it. When you give thine alms. So again, I have to ask this like we did last Sunday. When you pray, and I ask the question, so when did you pray? And how are you doing with that? Uh, did you carve out time this week? The week's getting away from you. It's, we're at the middle of the week. Did you carve out a solitude time to pray between you and the Lord? Um, and that's what we ask because Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray, same thing when giving merciful alms to the poor. You have to ask, when was the last time you gave something to the poor? Um, and it's such a, it's such a you know, it's amazing. Uh, we, we don't think about it as much, but when you just give to the poor, there's something that's heartwarming about it. There's something that we get to do that's sort of a blessed thing. Jesus says, when you do this, I hope we're, well, Brett, they're just gonna buy meth. Well, that's just a stingy person that's, you know, assuming something, but they are, Brett, I, I know. But it's funny how the Bible doesn't say you're supposed to short, pull up their sleeve, let's see if there's any needle marks on their arms or anything. Uh, showing mercy is something that doesn't always require a person passing a test for them to receive mercy. And sometimes the Lord will lead you to give something to someone just because, just for the sake of giving. Um, and maybe it's more about what's going on in your heart and less about the meth addict that the Lord wants you to give up some of your cash or your money or whatever. Um, so something we have to kind of be careful for. Um, now, when Jesus says this, when you give your alms, don't sound the trumpet like the Pharisees do. Now, this is a funny practice. I mean, this kind of makes me laugh a little bit if you think about it. The, what was happening in Jesus's day is they'd walk down the city and they, they would give their alms to the poor and then they would go, dur, 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 dur. they'd tr shoot their little trumpet off. Uh, so everybody would go, wow, look at the Pharisees. They're so giving. Look at how much they gave. They're amazing. Uh, and man, next time I want to be around that guy when he's passing out the dough, man. Uh, like there was a reputation thing these guys were into. Now, some of you might say, well, when did that practice come into play? And how did, how did that Looney Tune sort of blowing your trumpet thing happen? You wanna know how it happened? It started with, first they would, this is what they would do, is the Pharisees would go and they'd stand in the city center and then they'd blow their trumpet, dur, 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 and that would make all the poor people come and they would just start handing out money to the poor people. Um, the original intention was to get people's attention uh, to know, well, this is, you come to this guy, he's got the horn, he just blew it. So this is, gets your, you know, it's your free soup kitchen or whatever. Uh, here's the freebie that you have for you. So somewhere along the way, it turned to this hypocritical blowing of the trumpets so everybody could see your giving of your alms. Um, and so it kind of amalgamated and changed over time. But the Lord is saying, do your alms, give, show mercy to people um, in secret where nobody sees what you're doing. Um, man, this is such an important thing. Uh, so far, you know, from Sunday, we learned about prayer in secret and that it's better to be praying when nobody knows you're praying. Same with the giving of alms, mercy, showing mercy, not letting people know what you're doing. There's a great old story because, it, I'm sorry, I always quote Spurgeon and I talk about Spurgeon, but outside of the Bible, he's one of my favorite, you know, Bible teachers. Um, and Charles Haddon Spurgeon there in the 1850s in London. Um, there's a kind of a funny story about this. Uh, he and his wife, um, Spurgeon and his wife, they owned a, a, a fairly large chicken coop in their backyard. Um, and you know, back then Spurgeon, he had a big house and the church took really great care of he and his wife and he was very popular. People came from all over the world to hear Charles Spurgeon preach the Bible. Um, so it wasn't like he was financially hurting or anything like that. But he had these chickens and they would sell eggs from their chickens that were laid there. They'd sell them at a pretty, pretty expensive price. Um, and they refused to give any eggs away. People would come, hey, I'll go to your church, man. Can I have some, uh, you know, hey bro, can I have some chicken eggs? And he's like, nope, they're, you know, so much money and this is, you gotta pay for them. And, and they were starting to be known for being kind of stingy, uh, miserly with their chickens and their eggs. Um, and, uh, and, and so the Spurgeons just accepted this criticism. They never once defended themselves. And it was only af after Mrs. Spurgeon died that the whole story was eventually revealed. The Spurgeon never spent one penny on their eggs. They made a lot of money, but the money was then given to these two little old ladies that were part of their church uh, who needed support financially. Um, and they were fully supported by Spurgeon's eggs 
even though he never mentioned this from the pulpit or told anybody, um, um, that might have been one of the greatest sermons Spurgeon ever preached, the one that he didn't. You know, because he just, he just by showing mercy uh, later on, it came out. This is, this is that El Eomos Noe, that, 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 that showing alms or mercy, in, uh, showing mercy in secret, where no one knows what you're doing by helping others. And this is what Jesus is asking. But when you doest thou alms, let not your left hand um, know what your uh, right hand is doing. What's that phrase? That's become sort of a byword now. It's like a saying that we say, even people that don't read their Bibles use this phrase. And it's a phrase basically saying, keep it a secret. Don't even let your, your hands know what's going on in the other hand. Uh, keep it, that means uh, painfully secret. Um, and so here's your assignment for the rest of this week. Not only do you, A, need to find a secret place to pray, but now we need to find a secret place to show alms or show mercy or give, give alms or mercy. And, and you know, it's interesting, the Bible says here, if you do this in secret, then what happens, and this isn't why you do it, this is just the result of doing this alms secretively. The Lord says, when your alms are in secret, your father which sees in secret himself shall reward thee openly. That's just a promise of God's word. If you're showing mercy behind the scenes when nobody else is looking, the Lord says, guess what? I will reward you openly. Now, when is that? Could it be this life? Maybe, but for sure it's gonna be the next life because a lot of the rewards we get are gonna come at the bema seat judgment of Christ. When we die and go to heaven, we're gonna stand before the judgment, not for our sins, praise the Lord, but for the work that we did and the stuff that was, nobody saw, the stuff that was in secret, the Lord says, I'm gonna reward you at the bema seat judgment. So that's what happens here um, uh, with the Spurgeons. They're a good example for keeping it secret. Uh, but the second section, now we move on from, you know, guidance on giving in secret, showing mercy in secret. The next section here, verses five through 15, is points on praying. And we looked at this on Sunday, but let's just kind of go over, there's a few little loose ends I feel like we need to tie up. Sorry about that. But uh, it is the Sermon on the Mount. So verse five, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth thee in secret, shall reward thee openly. The reason I'm reading this again is I want you to see it's the same thing as the alms. There's a, there's a pattern here. It's almost like Jesus' is sort of assembly line. And okay, first we got our alms, ka-ching, ka-ching. Now we got our prayer time, ka-ching, ka-ching. Uh, do it in secret. The Lord is gonna reward you openly. Don't be doing these spiritual things, um, you know, to, uh, to, to be seen of men, uh, but to do it in, in uh, quietness and secretive. That's kind of the deal. Well, verse seven, but when you pray, you shall not um, uh, pray, you shall not, uh, pardon me, verse seven. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. Um, we talked about this in depth on Sunday, but you know, the thing is, I, I really didn't just mention the simple truth of this. Um, the Lord hears short little prayers that are heartfelt. Don't feel like you have to pray long prayers. There's somehow we think we're more spiritual. Um, you know, remember the story there in uh, uh, Numbers chapter 12, when uh, Miriam starts challenging Moses' uh, leadership. She's being critical of Moses' leadership. Remember that? And what's interesting about that to me is um, this criticism turned into leprosy. Remember when Miriam, his older sister, got like, now you gotta feel bad for Miriam because she's kind of this amazing woman, really. She's one of the amazing women of the Bible. But um, she actually, the criticism of Moses, God took that really seriously because Moses was the guy God, God called clearly to be the leader of the children of Israel. That was very, very clear. No question about that. But, but she questioned God's purpose in you know, making Moses the leader. And then suddenly she's stricken with leprosy, that loathsome, horrible biblical era disease where your skin would start to rot and stink and get crusty and, and like, it's a horrible thing. You know, your extremities would start to fall off uh, and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, Aaron comes and says, Moses, pray for Miriam. She's, she's gonna die of leprosy. 
Um, and um, now what did they do? Did they run her across the stage in front of the congregation of Israel, throw wheelchairs off the stage and ask for healing? Heal her in Jesus' name, woo! Did they whoop and holler and do weird stuff? No, no. Uh, again, I just, like I pointed out Elijah's prayer, look at Moses' prayer. And Moses cried to the Lord saying, heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. The end, that's it. Eight words Moses prays and bada bing. Miriam's free of leprosy. And, and the Lord answers this very simple prayer. Why? Because it's a heartfelt request from Moses. Eight words that the Lord heard, not because of fancy words, not because of much speaking, kept it simple, but it was true coming from <clears throat> his heart. And thus uh, the Lord honored that. And then verse nine, after this manner, therefore pray ye. Um, Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, um, again, the holiness of the name. By the way, there's something more um, holy than the Lord's name. Does anybody know what is more holy than the name of the Lord? Yes, the word of God. Isn't that interesting? Because I think of the name of the Lord, like, wow, that's holy. Holy is your name, but more holy is your word. Why do we know that? Well, Psalm 132 tells us, pardon me, 138 verse two says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Uh, and, and the reason I, I point that out is when we say, you know, uh, hallowed is your name, uh, we're saying his name is holy, but his word is even more holy, as, as the Bible tells us. And we know that from 1 John 1.1 1, 1 again, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And then in verse 14, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus, who's the living word, the, uh, the word incarnate. So when you tag uh, at the end of your prayer in Jesus' name, um, what, what you're doing is you're assigning his nature, his character, uh, you know, and who he is to your prayer. And, um, and, uh, and then also you're supposed to, by, by uh, saying the name of the Lord, you're also kind of in a, in a way trying to say, not my will, but thy will be done. Um, so, so that's it. The points on praying here are, are pretty heavy. And if you missed Sunday, we went over this all in detail. But then he says in verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Um, you know, it's interesting because this is talking about the second coming of Christ, the millennial kingdom, as we talked about Sunday. But, um, you know, it's interesting. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The will of God is being done in earth and, or in heaven. And someday it's gonna be brought out in earth, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, you say, doesn't Satan still have access uh, into sort of heaven, Job chapter one? Um, yeah, but God is totally in control, it seems, of heaven. That's what the Bible indicates. But eventually there's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth and uh, Satan's gonna be done away with. That's, that's when we say thy kingdom come, that's what we're praying for. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread uh, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, one thing I didn't talk about on Sunday, uh, when it says forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, um, some of you might be tempted to say, but Brett, what happened to being saved by grace um, through faith, which we are. You're, uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, you're saved by grace through faith, not of your works. So what if I am bitter toward someone and, um, and I'm unforgiving toward them? Uh, can I still go to heaven? Interesting question, have you thought about that? Uh, some people have, and so you kind of have to wrestle with this a little bit. Um, here, here's what I would say about this, this is important, because you are saved by God's grace. So, um, and um, it does seem like unforgiveness, is that the unpardonable sin that we talked about last week? No. So grace does cover unforgiveness, but, but here's the thing. Um, unforgiveness uh, is a problem when, he, when, when Jesus puts it in verse, let's go forward again, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will, not also, will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. And some of you might say, well, Brett, then I'm toast, except for God's grace. Well, let me just, let me just split some hairs here, if you'll allow me just for a second. Is there a difference between forgiveness and the bitterness that you're holding toward a person? I would say yes. Remember when we talked about loving your enemy and we talked about this notion of you change your mind and then what? Good, God will then change your heart. You can't change your heart. 
That's too hard. You just keep telling yourself, okay, I'm not gonna hate them, I'm not gonna hate them, I'm not gonna hate them, but you hate them all the more. Um, that's kind of the important thing there. So what about this forgiveness? Same thing, you've gotta change your mind and that's what forgiveness is. You're gonna say, I'm choosing to forgive this person like Jesus did. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness. So that's, that's a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. Bitterness is something that has to be worked out in your heart that the Lord has to change. I think it's the same deal really. And, and you and I should kind of be aware of that that um, you change your mind. When it comes to this idea of forgiveness, one of the things you have to change your mind about is saying, I'm choosing to forgive this person, I'm forgiving them. But then to be able to say, okay, Lord, now you've gotta take this bitterness I have toward them and change my heart. Um, so uh, we're not God where we can forgive and forget sins. That's the Lord who does that. You change your mind, let God change your heart. So that's kind of the deal right there. Well, all that to say, um, back to verse 13, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Um, amen. One thing I mentioned I'd talk a little bit more about tonight, um, and I, I do wanna talk about this. Um, can the Lord lead us or, or tempt us? Does the Lord tempt us? Um, and I heard some no's, right? But then why would you pray this? Lead us, Lord, not into temptation. Well, we touched on it on Sunday, but there's a verse, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So um, jot this one down in your notes. It's James chapter one, verses 13 through 16. Look at this. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every, man's, uh, but every man is tempted, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brothers. So um, th th this verse tells us a lot of stuff, but one of the things it tells us is, um, first of all, God doesn't tempt us to sin. Uh, don't say that, it says, don't even say that. Um, but when we're tempted, that's not the sin yet. Just because you're tempted, and this is something I've noticed Christians struggle with. Sometimes you, if you're tempted to sin, you already feel like you've sinned just by being tempted. Uh, but that's not the case. It's when you act on the sin that that's actually where it becomes sin. The, again, not to be too flashy with the, um, but, um, you know, with, with the language here, but the word tempted that is used here and also in the Lord's Prayer is this interesting uh, uh, word in the Greek. It's, it's the word parosmos, uh, which uh, is, an, uh, if you break it down, there's, there's three main um, definitions that are kind of interesting. An experiment, attempt, trial, proving. The trial of man's fidelity and integrity, virtue and constancy. Temptation, i.e. Uh, trial of God by men. So there's a, there's a trying or a testing that God will do. And he'll allow us to go through times of testing. Um, if there's a lot of these in the Bible. Uh, when Abraham was brought up uh, you know, Mount Moriah with Isaac and he was supposed to plunge a knife into Isaac's chest, his son, and sacrifice him. That was a test that God gave to Abraham. And he passed the test. And fortunately, Isaac was not killed. The Lord put a substitutionary um, you know, ram in its place. Interesting idea. But all that to say, that was a test. So sometimes the Lord does allow us to go through testing, but there's a definite, definite difference between testing and then trying to lure you into sin. And that's what God doesn't do. Um, so you might even say in Jesus's prayer, back to the Lord's prayer, uh, Jesus, you know, you might say, lead us not into trials of testing or when I am tested, may I not fall into the situations that bring about the fruit of sin. Does that make sense? So, so it's kind of important to notice the difference. Satan is the one who really wants us to, he lures us and wants to make us, you know, um, uh, sin. God doesn't want that. So that's kind of important. So we've already covered, number one, guidance on giving, verses one through five. Points on praying, verses six uh, through 13. And now to keep my alliterations going, fun with fasting. <laughs> so I, I hear a groan from some of my brothers in Christ, uh, more than one way of being brothers. Uh, fun with fasting, oh no, not fasting. One of the things as a verse by verse, chapter by chapter Bible teacher, I'm really glad we don't have to teach a lot is fasting. 
Uh, it's one of the things I like the least in the Bible. Perhaps that's horrible for you to say it. I'm just being honest. I'm very real uh, and uh, I like food, but believe it or not, I do appreciate and think that fasting is something that we all should do. Um, when I was a kid, uh, thankfully, my parents uh, taught us about fasting. Um, I remember my mom particularly explaining biblically what fasting was all about. And she went through the whole enchilada and she even read this, I shouldn't use the term enchilada. <laughs> See, I'm already getting hungry just talking about this. <laughs> Gotta find a Mexican restaurant after church. Um, <laughs> verse 16, uh, he says, moreover, when you fast, uh-oh, there it is again. So, so far we've got when you give alms, uh, when you pray, now, um, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not to, un, unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth thee in secret, shall reward thee openly. Um, remember the assembly line of secret things Jesus wants us to do? This is another one. So when you give alms, when you pray, and now, whoo, when you fast. Um, so when I was a kid, my mom taught us, when, when we, and we would take a day at a time. My mom would say, okay, when do you wanna fast, Brett? You know, and so I remember on our summer break, I remember there'd be days I'd just choose to fast, whole day. And, uh, and then she explained what we're supposed to do. Use it time for prayer, um, the time you'd normally spend sitting at a table eating. Take that time and, and go to your knees in prayer and, and to make sure your face doesn't look all sad when you're fasting. Uh, by the way, if you go to the Middle East, uh, I've been there during Ramadan and our poor Muslim friends, you know, have to fast. Uh, and they fast, they fast all day until the evening uh, and then they can eat again. Um, so their faces are all down. Like, it's pretty funny. They'll close their shops like five hours early because uh, they want to get home and, well, wait for the sun to go down so we can eat. Uh, but they, you know, they're, uh, they're hangry over there. Don't, if, don't go to the Middle East and during Ramadan because there's there just be a bunch of hangry Muslims. Uh, but if you're a Christian fasting, um, then we're supposed to have uh, shiny faces and not be walking around, uh, um, I feel so weak and hungry. Um, and that's what my mom taught us as kids. And we did that. And so that kind of transferred on. And there are times that I feel like um, it's appropriate uh, in my own spiritual walk to fast. Um, I'm just gonna say, I don't do it enough. I'd like to do it more. Um, when should we fast? Um, uh, you know, Jesus said, it's not if, but it's when, when you fast, um, you know, um, how, much, how much do we do this? Um, by the way, uh, there's a lot of books that have been written on fasting and I have to warn you, some of the groups get into the more the health benefits and stuff of fasting, which there's, there's all that. Some of you are into your, some of you guys are like, yeah, Brad, intermittent fasting. Uh, I've lost 180 pounds, intermittent fasting. Um, uh, um, and that's great. If you wanna do intermittent fasting for that, that's great, but that's not what, what Jesus is talking about, okay? There's a big separation here. If you're doing intermittent fasting, God bless you, uh, but uh, by the way, you know, you guys that are all sanctimonious bread, I quit drinking alcohol and I, I don't do crack anymore. You should be able to stop going to Taco Bell. Um, here's the difference. You can quit cold turkey with, you know, cocaine and you're gonna live. If I quit eating food cold turkey, I'm gonna die. So it's like an alcoholic having just have a few sips every day. Uh, but you know, like uh, food is different. It's a challenge. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm joking, sort of. Um, but uh, anyway, um, but this whole thing about if you're doing it for health reasons, great. But I, I think there needs to be separation when you're fasting for the purposes of prayer. Um, there's gotta be a mental, spiritual separation. That's, that's my, my read on it. And so uh, I, I still love to recommend this. It's, it's a really old book from the 1970s. Um, and, and if you get it on Amazon, I think even the artwork still looks 70s and you'll, you'll just dismiss it as some weird uh, book from the 70s. But it, it's actually a book called God's Chosen Fast by Arthur Wallace. Uh, and I, I really love that. It's just a little booklet. Uh, it's not super long, but he uh, goes into biblical fasting and keeping it more on the spiritual plane, less on the, the um, health food, uh, you know, um, whole paycheck, I mean, whole foods uh, model or whatever, uh, kale model or whatever. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's just biblical kind of different models of fast, fasting. He talks about partial fast or whole fast where you're 
taking you know, a chunk of time uh, to fast, fasting from eating and also fasting from other things. You can, it doesn't just have to be food. And, and do you do uh, liquid or not? Like he goes into all the biblical things about fasting. So that's just a good little, it's not a long read, it's not hard, but it's, it's, I find it very refreshingly simple. Now, um, when, when should a person fast? I think there are a few situations where fasting can be particularly advantageous. Um, do you ever feel bound up spiritually by something or messed with or depressed or burdened spiritually? Like there's a, you know, I don't believe in Christians being demon possessed, but I believe in demon oppression. And, um, and you know, there's, there's, there's sometimes evil things that are uh, going on around us. Um, look at what Isaiah says, Isaiah 58, verses six and seven. You can mark this down in your notes when it comes to this fasting. Is not that the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, there's reason number one. Number two, to undo the heavy burdens. Are you burdened by heavy things? To let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal with thy bread to the hungry? that thou bring to the poor that are cast out of thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Um, what's going on here? There's, there's spiritual things that um, are bondage, wickedness, uh, oppression, and even the oppression of the poor and us eating our food while they're starving. Like there's some really interesting things there that is brought up here in Isaiah. But as it turns out, spiritual wickedness, oppressing, is also brought up in Matthew's gospel. Uh, in a few weeks, we'll be in Matthew chapter 17, and Jesus is gonna, remember this story? In Matthew 17, 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out, the demon? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, verse 21 is where it gets really interesting, but it says, how be it this kind, this demon, goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. There, there's a certain demonic entity that pr just regular old prayer doesn't seem to do the trick. So you really do need to get serious and say, I'm gonna pray through this demonic oppression or whatever it is, um, because this one doesn't come out. But now this is, I think, Jesus talking about literally casting out a demon out of a person. Um, but it makes you realize there's some demonic entities that there's like a next level where uh, the fasting and what have you uh, is, is the answer. So one of the things I love about this, because Jesus just whips it out and, and you know, says, you're out of there and, and the demon's gone. But the implication, Jesus had already been praying and fasting. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? It makes you wonder, did Jesus have a regular routine of prayer and fasting so that he was kind of ready for when demonic things came his way, he was just kind of ready to roll? There are those that suggest Jesus must have had a regular sort of way of fasting. Um, and maybe that's something for us to pray about ourselves. So uh, all that to say, uh, fasting. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I really am thankful for my parents teaching me spiritual disciplines when I was little because uh, otherwise I'm pretty sure an adult and I would have said, yeah, whatever on the fasting thing. I'm just not gonna do that one. Uh, but the Bible actually encourages fasting and it's something that um, we can all benefit from. So uh, fun with fasting, that's what I'm calling this. Uh, <laughs> so we've got guidelines on giving, number one. Points on praying, number two. And fun with fasting, number three. And then the next one is Truth about treasure, truth about treasure. And we're gonna see that there in verse 19 on next Wednesday night. I don't wanna dive into this one tonight um, because uh, this is such a huge thing and I don't wanna just race through this just to kind of finish up. But what I would like to remind us of is, is when Jesus is talking about this Sermon on the Mount, um, uh, you know, and, and, and when we kind of consider where we're at in our spiritual walk, I get the sense that Jesus is talking about the spiritually mature person. Remember when he said uh, in verse, chapter five, verse 48, be ye therefore perfect as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. Remember the word perfect can be also maturity, right? So I believe it's the mature Christian who starts to see the value of 
the guidelines on, or the guidance on giving. How do you give your alms? Uh, when you show mercy to people, do you do that in secret or do you make sure and let people know about it? Um, uh, again, that's one of the reasons why old Pastor Brett doesn't look at the tithes and offerings. Who gives what? I, do, I've, I explained that the other day uh, during our tithe and offering and when we were in Malachi, we talked about tithes and offerings. Uh, the second time I've done the sermon uh, in all the years of Athe Greek on tithing. By the way, I got a letter uh, from a guy from that sermon that just went on and on, Brett, all you did is ask for money. Uh, which I was like, man, I have never once asked for money, not one time. Uh, and I, in all my sermons, everything I've ever said is online for everybody, you can search it all you want but you will never hear me asking for money because that's not what we do at Athey Creek. I will talk about tithing and why do I do that? I do that. Some people say, well, Brett, Athey Creek, that's just your sneaky way of trying to get money. It's not. Uh, you know, if the Lord doesn't provide, then we just don't do stuff. Uh, that's kind of the way Athey Creek rolls. If the Lord provides, then we'll, we'll build our building and we'll do stuff that, we, that the Lord puts on our heart to do. But um, you know, this whole thing of asking for money, and this guy went on and on how I'm just like all the other charlatans out there. And it was kind of this scathing letter from some attorney in Lake Oswego. Um, but um, I, I, we could talk about who's scamming people for money, uh, but <laughs> I won't go there. I won't go there. That's, that's not holy. But. But the reason, the, like I mentioned in that tithing sermon, the one that I did uh, after uh, 26 years, the second one that I did, um, the, the reason that's such an important thing is for you and I to be those who give. But, but that's why, one of the other reasons, not only that I don't let the big givers at Athey Creek influence what I teach and preach, that's one of the reasons I don't wanna see who gives what. But another reason I don't wanna look at see who gives is so that we can not know what the left hand and the right hand are doing. Um, that you're not, you know, I'm not going, wow, there's a really good donation person at Athey and you're getting the credit for that. And Jesus says, what happens? There you have your reward. So this guidance on giving in secret, but also the points on praying, praying in secret. The mature believer is gonna be giving without being seen. The mature believer, the, the one who's moving on to perfection is gonna be praying without looking for the accolades of men and saying, wow, what a prayer warrior. Um, and then the, the fasting is, is uh, something that you can do with, and nobody even has to know. Um, you can just take your lunch break at work and go off somewhere and find a quiet place to pray. Uh, and, uh, and nobody has to know the difference. Uh, and that's the idea, the mature believer. And then we're gonna um, see on, on next week the truth about our treasure. And that's gonna be important. So all that said, let's pray. And then we can enjoy this beautiful sunset on the way home that you're all missing over here. Uh, once again, <laughs> but you guys are being blessed, right? Yes. Lord, we are thankful. Oh, this is such a beautiful scene here and just a chance to, to finish up on a Wednesday night. Lord, these, these, um, these points are so powerful, Lord. And I, I sense that, Lord, my, my ineptitude in these areas to be able to just come to you in maturity and in the area of giving and praying and fasting. Lord, I pray that we'd move on from childish things and grow in maturity and, and learn from the Sermon on the Mount. Lord, we know we don't measure up. We, like Paul, admit our un, uh, inability, Lord. And even as Paul would recognize that he was the chiefest of sinners, Lord, we, we would argue with Paul on that one. Uh, but we're so thankful that you give us guidance and, and what, what the mature believer looks like. So I pray that you'd help us, Lord, that we would grow in our ability to follow your word. And, and Lord, not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers as well. So we pray your blessing on this congregation, Lord, tonight. Uh, for those online, for the watch parties out there, Lord, we just pray blessing on them. May they sense the, the word just filling their hearts even now as we speak, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.